way. Let's pray. We'll ask God to bless the reading of His Word today. Father, we open Your Word. We know that it changes our lives. We know that it touches our hearts. And we know and we stand on the truths and the promises that are in Your Word. And so today, Father, I pray, I ask You, Holy Spirit, that You 100% take over this message today and that You would be glorified and You would open our hearts and our ears so that we may hear and obey You in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So today, I want to talk to you about be a faith in action. And I have a couple of questions for you that I'm going to ask before we dive into God's Word. Are you actively engaged in your faith? That's the first question. Are you actively engaged in your faith? And the second question is, has your faith changed you? If your faith has changed you, if, or you're act, actively engaged in your faith, you are on the road that God has designed you to be on. And we're going to look inside of James today, and we're going to look at some scripture that talks about faith and works. And so if you uh, have your Bible, or you can actually look on the screen as well, we're going to look at James chapter... Uh, well, first we're going to look at Acts 1-8, and then we're going to look at James 2. But here's what the Lord told me. This is where this whole message came from today. This is what God says. Experiencing supernatural power is not a license for you and I to be lazy. Experiencing supernatural power. This is what Acts 1.8 says. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's supernatural power. That's not the power that comes from anything that we have. This is talking about supernatural dunamis dynamite power that comes to us through the power, through the Holy Spirit. And he says, that supernatural power will create in you a response. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, and throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. A witness. The power comes on us and then we turn around and we become a witness for the glory and the kingdom of God in our lives. Now, what witness would not testify to what they have been through? I always think about, and I hate to bring it up, but it is a reality of our past as a country. I remember when the planes flew into the Twin Towers. Now, I've seen the Twin Towers before, but I never saw that. I could see, I've seen how big those structures were, but seeing it on TV is a whole lot different than someone who experienced it there. Maybe somebody that was in the building that was able to get out, or maybe somebody's eating a bagel at a cafe, and they look up and they see the plane slam into the, the towers, and they see them collapse. That is a completely different version of that event than what I and you saw on TV. And they were witnesses to that. They were firsthand witnesses to that. So if you talk to me about the, what happened on September the 11th, then I would say, yes, here's where I was. I was driving to work on the day when Christy called me and said, hey, what's, you know, I heard it on the radio and then she called me. I, I was thinking, okay, what's going on? And then the second plane hit and I'm listening to it on the radio in my vehicle on the way to work. And I just couldn't believe it. I turned around, I came home and Christy was watching it on the television. And we just sat there in just shock of what was going on that day. But if you were to talk to somebody about it that was actually there, it would be a completely different story. They would be able to tell you what happened in real time, where they were, what they were doing, what they experienced, the ashes that fell on top of them, all of those different things. And here's the, here's the tie-in with that. When you and I have an experience with Jesus, that should shake us to the point where our faith becomes active. In other words, if we say, I had an experience with, with Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit resides in me, and I'm just casual about it. Now, I'm not saying you are casual about your walk with God. But there have been times and moments and seasons in my life where I've been really casual about my walk with Christ. 
I've been really casual about the fact that Jesus Christ Himself came in human form, died on a cross for my sins, rose again on the third day, walked out of the grave for my sins, for your sins. I've been really casual about that. And so I have to question my own faith. I have to say, was that, was, am I a witness? Have, have I experienced the reality of Jesus in my life? Or have I just heard about it from a secondhand source? Because that's what today is. Today you're hearing about Jesus and you're hearing from His Word as powerful as, as it is, you're hearing it from a secondhand source. From my experience. And that's different from your experience. Because all of us experience Jesus Christ differently. Now we all are unified under the umbrella of Christ in this church. We are in unity knowing that Jesus Christ did what He did. But your story about your experience with Jesus Christ is different than my story about Jesus Christ. And so what I want us to do and what I want to challenge us to do today is to get alive and active and rise up in our faith and begin marching forward in obedience to Christ in whatever He's called you to do. Whatever He's called you to do. To get passionate about your salvation. To say, I experienced Jesus Christ on a level that no one else can explain except me. And so I'm going to march out that experience. And I am going to be a witness of that firsthand account that I had with Jesus. And guess what? You have the power to do it. Because the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. You have the power to live out a witness, being a witness for Jesus Christ. And you might say, well, I don't feel like I have the power. I wake up most days and I'm, you know, depends on how old you are. I'm, I have a different ache in my body that, that day and I'm just trying to survive and, and I'm sleepy and I need my coffee. And yes, all those things are about our physical uh, attributes that we walk around with. But spiritually, you have the power to stand in front of a co-worker. You have the power to stand in front of your wife or your husband or your significant other and your children or a church member and say this. I have the boldness and the power to stand up and say this is what God has called me to do. This was my experience with Jesus Christ and I'm going to be obedient and passionate about what Jesus Christ has done for me. And we continue on in in that journey you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses so we need to understand that we need to get that into our being into our heart into our mind that you and I have the power to be bold in a dark world to stand up for the things that are of God we as the church need not shrink back into fear and say oh well I don't know I don't want to step on anyone's toes let me tell you something. When you share the love of God in, so, in your life to someone else, you're not stepping on their toes. You're inviting them into the most significant, most awesome relationship they could ever have. And I get it that there are things in the Bible that are controversial. But you know what? Jesus Christ came and He said He is bringing about His kingdom in this place. And His kingdom has rules and it has ways of doing things. And I don't want to get caught up in legalism, but I know that if I have the power of the Holy Spirit living in me and pushing, pushing me forward in obedience, I am going to be what God has called me to be. And I'm not going to shrink back. I'm tired of being casual about my faith. And I'm tired of shrinking back in fear and saying, well, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Let me tell you something. God's way is the only way. And we cannot back away from the way, the truth, and the life as we march on in our life here on this earth. So James 2, 14 through 26 says this. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is, is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So today, 
I am challenging you and I am challenging myself to step up and be active in our faith, be active in our relationship with Jesus Christ. In other words, if you just saw a need and, and you walk, walked over to that person and you gave them lip service and you're like, I'm sorry, and I, t I don't mean to, I don't, we do pray, but, but when we say, I'll pray for you, and I'm so guilty of doing this, but I'll say, I will pray for you, and I really mean that, I will pray for them, and I do pray for them, whatever need you have, you come up to me and I'll pray. But if we stop there, um, and we can help that person, that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus says, go the extra mile. Take that person to where they need to go. Be active in your faith. If we claim to have faith, what we might actually have is this, an intellectual knowledge of a set of Christian principles. In other words, I can stand up here, it's easy to stand up here and talk to you about faith in action. But on Monday morning, what am I going to do with it? Where am I going to go? How am I going to lead somebody to a relationship with Jesus Christ without works, without going and helping that person? You know, I've heard this and you've heard it a thousand times, if not more. It's not, they don't know what is it? How much you care until they care how much you know? No, they don't know. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so when we respond in love and in faith and our, our lives are active in our faith, then people begin to be drawn towards the Spirit of God in our life. And let me give you some examples. First of all, faith in action requires a response. Faith in action requires a response from you and I. If our life remains unchanged, write this one down, Rhonda. If our life remains unchanged, then we haven't experienced authentic faith. Husbands, Jesus says to love your wife the way um, He loves the church, the way Christ loves the church. We find that in Ephesians. But if you love them in public and you treat them like dirt when the door closes behind you at, at, at night in your home, then you're not living out authentic faith. You, you might have a set, an intellectual knowledge of a set of Christian principles, but you're not acting out your faith. Wives, I know this is getting kind of touchy, but if wives, it says submit to your husband, and I know a lot of ladies going to say, well, I don't submit to my husband because he doesn't love me the way Christ loves the church. So if he's not going to do his thing, I'm not going to do my thing. And I know that there are different opinions about this in this room, and that's cool. But my question is, wives, what has he called you to do? Men, what has he called you to do? And when those two operate, when, when it starts with the head of the household, when the man loves the wife the way Jesus loves the church, then it's a no-brainer for those wives to fall under the security and the safety of that man that is following after the heart of Jesus. Here's a biggie for you. And this has nothing to do with me, but this has a lot to do with some Facebook posts I see that make me cringe when I see them from a Christian. God has said to respect those in authority over you because they are the ones He has chosen to rule over you. Now, I'm not talking about Trump. I'm not getting political here. What I'm saying is when I see Facebook posts that literally destroy the character of someone, I, that might be who they are. And you might be saying, well, pastor, I just, I'm promoting reality. Well, you don't really know the heart of that person. And so when you get out there and you destroy that person, or you stand up on your soapbox and you tell them like it is, are you, exp are you expressing the love of Christ? That's what I want you to understand. Are you expressing the love of Christ right before you rip somebody apart on Facebook? Now, let me give you this example. And I've given this example before, but I still like to use it. I remember before the changes happened, the uh, car washes here in town, they're just kind of subpar, okay? I'm just going to lay it out there. And I remember one time I was sitting under the car wash, and I'd paid my $10, and I was sitting there, and the soap got all over my car, and then it stopped. 
And I was mad. I'm like, at least I got, <laughs> at least I got the soap, right? So I was upset because my, my, I couldn't get my car washed. But I'm sitting here and all the soaps just running down my car. And I came so close to just get right there in the middle of that car wash to get on Facebook and say, I don't know who owns these car washes, which I do, but, <laughs> but these things are terrible and they need to be fixed. And I was going to rip that dude to shreds. And then, honestly, I know this is kind of a light example of it, but then God was like, really, you're going to do that? Just... You really gonna you really gonna you really gonna put my name on that Facebook post, Pastor? I'm like, no. Click, 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 click. Back it up. Delete it. I'm not saying that he has any authority over me. I'm just I kind of got sidetracked here on what we put on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever you use. But but I um, I decided not to. And the next time I was at the car wash, the owner showed up or he was there, and um, I just mentioned it to him and I said, you know, I. It's not a big deal. I went home. I rinsed it off. It's okay. I just wanted you to know. And I was kind of letting him know that his system was broken. But I was also letting him know the inconvenience that he put me under. I mean, I was just devastated for like 30 minutes. <laughs> and uh, he, you know what he said? I am so sorry. I'm, I, I know I've been having trouble with these things. I'm out here all the time. I'm trying to get them fixed. He gave me a free car wash and he was like, I'm so sorry. And I went on my way and that was God even speaking to me again going, thank you for not putting my name on a post that would have ripped somebody else in your community apart because you were inconvenienced. Now I know that that might be a very light example, but let me tell you something. When your faith and my faith is in action, even the smaller things in life, which we, we, ha we um, go through the smaller things in our faith more often than we do the bigger things. So in other words, what I'm saying is, is we, can, we can talk about faith when I'm in a hospital bed or when I've got some big issue going on in my life, I can say, well, I'm just standing on faith and, and my faith is alive and well. And that is great. I'm so glad because God is in the big things, but God is also in the details. And so every little thing that we go through, are we putting the name of Jesus on that and letting our faith live out in that situation? So going back to your boss or the president of the United States or those kinds of things, God says he's chosen those people to rule over you. That's in Romans 13. It's in Hebrews 13. It's in 1 Peter 2. And we go around bad-mouthing them, then our faith is dead. I'm just telling you. We might have an intellectual knowledge of Christian principles, but our faith is dead because God says to pray for your enemies, to love your enemies, to submit to those who are over you, to walk in love with those people. And so what he's challenging us to do instead of talk about them, pray for them. Pray for those that are in authority over you. Not how you want them to be, not what you want them to be, but what God wants them to be. If you got an issue with somebody, pray for that person. For God, you know, change their mind. They're wrong. I'm right. Change their mind. I'm just kidding. You pray for them. To say, God, you, whatever you want for that person, that's what I want. How about, how about this one? How about when, when God says, do not provoke your children to anger? He says it in Ephesians. Um, says it in Ephesians 6. Uh, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. But if you're, if you're constantly yelling at your kids and they are frustrated, and, and guess what? You have an intellectual knowledge of faith, but you don't have faith because God is telling you to raise your children up and do not provoke your children to wrath. Now you might be saying, Pastor, you don't know my kids. They get on my ever-loving nerves. 
And yeah, I get it. We lose our cool sometimes. We lose it. But what I'm trying to tell you today is that God is in the business of changing you. If God says in His Word, do not provoke your children to wrath and anger, then we've got to listen to that. I'm not talking about not correcting and instructing, but if we go around yelling at our children all the time, then, then we have to really take an introspective look. And when God talks to me about being the pastor of this church, and He says, I want you to equip the church to do the work of the ministry, and I don't do that, then my faith is dead. I have got a, a spiritual knowledge of Christian principles, but I'm not actively working out my faith. I go on, but you get the idea. Not only does, does it require um, a response, it requires examination. Faith in action requires a response from us, and it requires an examination from us. Now, this is where I want to go with this. If you want your faith to change you, then you are going to need to go a little deeper in your heart than just believing that God exists. So let me give you this verse, verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good for you. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So if we want to go deeper, and we want our, our, our faith to change us. We've got to go a little bit deeper than believing in God. You might say, oh, I believe in God. Do you believe that He has the power to change you? Because that's the game changer. That's when you start accepting the power of the Most High God living inside of you. That's the game changer. And so we, 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 we have to ask ourselves, well, how do I do that? Let me go to Psalm 139. It says, search me, God. So we have to take, we have to examine where we are. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me. This is a very dangerous prayer. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Faith requires an introspective look and it requires us asking God, where is it in my life that I need help with? I don't know if you, about you, but I'm, there are times I don't like praying that prayer because I don't like hearing the answer because I'm pretty comfortable in the way that I do things. And when God starts to rattle my comfort and says, there's a couple things you need to work on inside of your, in your walk. And I'm going to help you through that because you have the power of the Holy Spirit in you. That, that faith in action says, search me and then change me. Search me and then change me. Faith requires examination. And the last thing I want to tell you, it's hot in here. Y'all hot? Gosh. I, think, I guess it's me on fire up here. I don't know. Faith in action takes ownership. Listen to this. It is knowing who you are and your, your walk with God, not somebody else's walk. This is really cool because we're going to find out in just a second. A lot of times we'll say, I wish I had their faith or I wish I had that person's faith. If I only had their faith, then I wouldn't have to, then I would be a better follower of Jesus. Let me give you two examples that are in James of the the different sides of the spectrum, okay? So you've got one guy named Abraham. I guess most of y'all have heard of Abraham. And Abraham, James is saying, was not Abraham justified by, justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar, okay? So you've got the guy that's fixing to be the father of nations. His, his son, God says, go to the, to the mountain, offer him up as a sacrifice. And, and, and he says, Abraham says, well, God, if that's what you're asking me to do, that's what I'll go do. And his faith was active to the point that he marched up the mountain with his son to do exactly what God had told him to do. Now, father of nations, big wig in the Bible. Check this girl out, Rahab. Likewise, in verse 25, was not Rahab the harlot, the prostitute, also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? So here she was. 
She was inside of the city of Jericho, if you don't know the story of Rahab, and she helped the Israelites conquer uh, her city. She betrayed her own city to help God's people. And so here's this other person on the other side of the spectrum that says, my faith in action requires me to do this. Abraham's faith in action required him to do that, and this lady's Faith in action required her to do that. Completely different stories, completely different times, completely different people, and yet their faith in action is what God is talking about here in James. Amen. So you got the father of all nations and a prostitute, and he's comparing them because of their faith. Now that's pretty powerful to me. And he used Abraham, and he used Rahab, and... And He wants to use us. There's individuality in your faith. I call it this. I, I, you know, I like the way Gino comes up with words. You know, he'll put two words together like hybrid faith or demonic strategy or what else you got, G? I can't remember. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Maybe it was Rick. I call it, I call this, when you stop comparing your faith with someone, someone else, unified, are you ready for this? This is good. This is good. Unified independence. Woo! <laughs> unified independence. Let me share with you what I mean by that. Our faith as a body is in Christ, right? Our faith together under this umbrella, our, we're under the umbrella of faith in Jesus Christ. All of us have faith in Jesus Christ. But each one of us live out our faith differently. Unified together independence. Um, your personality is different than everybody else's. Your job is different. Your circumstances are different. But under the umbrella of our faith in Jesus Christ, we live our faith out differently than anybody else. So God might call me to do something, and it'll be completely different than what He calls you to do. But the point here is to live it out. The, the point is, is to say, this is who I am. This is who God created me to be. This is all the stuff that I've gone through in my life. Now God's asking me to live that out. And usually when He asks you to live it out, He'll take your, your, your weaknesses. He'll take your wounds. This is how God works. He'll take your wounds, the, the things that almost destroyed you, that Satan was going to use to destroy you, and He will take that and use that in your life to encourage other people that are going through the same thing. He looks at our scars. I've talked about this before. He looks at our scars. He says, how can I use that scar from that wound? How can I use the brokenness of that person to bring healing to someone else? And that's when we say, I surrender and I will live out my faith in whatever you call me to do. Whatever it is you call me to do. There are things that have wounded us. There are things that have broken us. There are things that have almost destroyed us. And what we try to do with those things is pack them down in our hearts as far as they can go. And we never want to talk about them again. We say, nope, mm -mm. I'm not bringing that up again. I'm going to pack that as far as I can down in my heart. And so what happens, we lug it around. Just like a big old suitcase, we're just lugging it around. And what God is saying is if you will allow me to come inside your heart and start actively participating in your story, then guess what? You can not only unpack all of that stuff where you actually walk around free from the baggage where you say if, if the sun sets you free, what? You're free indeed. So God is saying you're free. And if you think that what you have gone through, and I'm not making light of what you've gone through, but every one of us have gone through things that have almost destroyed us. And God has picked us up out of the miry clay and set our feet on the solid rock and says, now live out your faith and tell other people about it. And so what I have the freedom and what you have the freedom to do is unpack that suitcase and say, this was 
my hurt. This was my wound. This is who I, I, this is what I went through. But I'm here today to live out my faith and share my story with you so that you can be encouraged and you can find healing and you can find restoration in your life. Because God uses us to bring revelation to people's lives so that He can bring restoration to their lives. So if you, have, if you have a revelation that can help someone else based on what you've been through, and you share that revelation with them, then God uses that by the power of the Holy Spirit activated in your life to bring that person into restoration. And that's what God is calling us to do. I don't want to be casual about that anymore. I don't want to say, well, I'm not this or I'm not that. Let me tell you something. Comparing yourself... Why is that not working? Okay. Never mind. Comparing yourself to someone else will destroy what God has designed you to accomplish for His kingdom and glory. I'm going to say that again. Comparing yourself to someone else will destroy what God has designed you to accomplish for His kingdom and glory. When I first started out in the ministry, and I've shared this before, but when I started out in the ministry, I wanted to be somebody, okay? I had, I had this mentality that I was just going to be the next greatest thing that God was bringing to the kingdom of God. And in my ego, God began chipping it away saying... It's about me, it's about me, it's about me, it's about me, it's about me. And I'd go through phases and seasons where I'd say, well, yeah, it's about you, but it's also about me, God. You know what I'm saying? Because I, here I am, look at me, under the spotlights, woo, it's all about me. I mean, it's all about you, but it's a little bit about me. And God just keeps chipping away at us and He says, it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with me. And I was comparing myself to other ministers that were in my eyes, had arrived to this place where they were. And I remember someone um, coming up to me after a sermon in the church plant that we were in, and he said, you remind me so much of so-and-so, which was this happens to be this pastor that I admired. And I was like, really? How about that? You, I remind you of him. Yeah, because I'm copying his behavior because I want to be just like him. But then this is what the other guy, that the guy said. You remind me of him, but be you. God needs you in the ministry, not another so-and-so. And I was like, wow. Yeah, I get to be me in the ministry. But it's not about me being me, it's about me being me so that He can be glorified. It doesn't just stop at me being me. Hey, I get to be me in the ministry. Hey, that's awesome. You get to be you in the ministry that God has called you to be. It doesn't stop there. It's, he says, you be you so that you can glorify me. It's not about you. I get you to a place where you are so focused on me that you bring glory to my name and you don't catch or get an ounce of that glory. It all goes to me. Every bit of it. And our faith in action says, whatever you call me to do, whatever you want me to do on a Monday morning, whatever I need to do tonight at my home with my family, you're calling me to that. I'm going to live that out. You're calling me to be who I am, to live it out, for your glory. And when we get that perspective, our faith comes alive in our, in our life. Because when we, when, we, when we take our story, our little story, and, and we, we can spend a lot of time in our, on our little story, okay? But if we, if we take our story and we... we Graft it in with God's story, there, the, the, there's more power in that. There's more power when we say, hey, God's done this for me. Or God has pulled me out of this and He's done this and He gets the glory for it. So here's my, here's my challenge and I'll, I'll stop. This is what I mean by unified independence. We're all under the umbrella of Jesus Christ, but you are independent to live out your faith the way God has designed you to live out your faith. Don't copy anyone. Just be you. Live out your faith and give God the glory. 
Worship team, will you come up for just a minute because we're going to baptize Clyde. Do you receive that word today?